Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time to uh, be willing to and your willingness to testify to the committee. Um, as I've said uh, previously, um, what we're going to ask you to do is make a brief opening statement, uh, and we have received written submissions, but in order to sort of for the record, and so um, these these uh, hearings are being broadcast live, um, so that people have a sense of your testimony. If if you'd make a brief opening statement and give the um, committee the opportunity then to ask you some questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves because honestly I don't want to get the names wrong so we're going to start with Senior Counsel to the Constitution Project. Hi, uh, Madhu Grawal with the Constitution Project. Good morning, Courtney Lawler, the University of Kentucky College of Law. Hi, I'm Larry Stengel. I'm a uh, district judge here in the Eastern District of uh, Pennsylvania, and I chair the Judicial Resources Committee. All right, and we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting the Constitution Project to testify. And as you probably read in our- uh, Can I ask you to pull the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. It feels so close. I know. <laughs> um, as you've likely read in our submitted testimony, we're a nonpartisan organization based in Washington, D.C., and we've been working on the right to counsel for decades. As Senior Policy Counsel, I work with our Blue Ribbon Bipartisan Committees, including our National Right to Counsel Committee, which has issued a number of comprehensive reports on the state of indigent defense in our country. Also, also on behalf of TCP, I work closely with many of the organizations and individuals who have testified before you um, in previous hearings. As you may know, we've been quite vocal on this issue, most recently uh, issuing an op-ed in the Huffington Post, which was uh, posted on your website about these hearings. Uh, we've submitted more detailed testimony that outlines our concerns on a number of topics, including funding, workload limits, the importance of data collection, and independence. And I want to just focus on two pieces today, um, independence and funding. I have no doubt that my comments are not new to this panel, so I'll keep them brief because I know I'm standing between you and lunch. Um, but I feel it's important to add to the chorus of groups that have already spoken about these issues um, and discuss the fundamental and necessary restructuring of the federal indigent defense system. Um, I first want to share a brief anecdote about my own reaction as a young attorney to the voucher system. Um, so when I was applying to law school, like many aspiring lawyers, I wrote my personal statement on the importance of public interest work and swore I would never work for a big law firm. And then I began law school and got some very good advice from a mentor who encouraged me to spend at least one summer working for a large law firm so I could see what it was like to work for a client when funding and resources were not an issue. Um, so I did just that. I spent a summer writing memos to associates and partners, which would then be sent on to clients, about legal strategy, including potential motions, experts, and a host of other issues. And then cut to my first clerkship after law school at the DC Superior Court, where I primarily assisted with misdemeanor criminal cases. And I learned that in addition to PDS, DC had a CJA panel system. I was surprised to learn that instead of memos to clients, and more importantly, approval from clients, for anything that may implicate funds, ranging from experts or filing motions, the, these sorts of decisions had to be justified to the presiding judge. It seemed to be a piece of the system where the clear conflict of interest just seemed to be addressed with a shrug. And when I asked about it, um, you know, why defense attorneys seem to be working for the judge instead of their clients, um, it was just sort of met with a, this is the way the system works and what are you going to do about it? Um, I felt that perhaps I was naive, but in reviewing testimony before this committee, it seems that I'm not alone in my sentiments as a young lawyer. The bottom line is that the right to effective assistance of counsel requires access to experts, investigators, translators, and other resources. And as you have heard from many people who have repeatedly testified before you, they do not seek expert assistance or they use experts who charge less, but are also less experienced because they fear not receiving future appointments. In several districts, defense attorneys must appear before judges in an ex parte hearing to justify their requests for expert services. Prosecutors, as you know, on the other hand, don't have to justify any of these expenses um, and there's no judicial intervention. 
I especially want to flag Steve Bright's comments before this testimony about how we discuss the various stakeholders in the criminal justice system. But the real stakeholders are those whose liberty is at stake, the clients and the people whose stories are often getting lost in these policy discussions. How odd that those folks aren't the ones who are approving funding or how their lawyer's time is allocated. It's those folks and the lives of their families and children who are implicated when their attorney's compensation is cut or their decisions are challenged by judges. Defendants are systematically de denied access to counsel and the trial resources they need to mount an adequate defense, and they're the ones who are suffering most because of it. This isn't to say this is the judiciary's fault, and quite the opposite. I know many judges who recognize these inherent conflicts, and judges who have testified before this committee that they would prefer not to be at the center of this process. Our National Right to Counsel Committee underscored the importance of creating an independent, adequately funded National Center for Defense Services out of the purview of the AO to eliminate the conflict resulting from federal defense attorneys having their pay, appointment, and ability to adequately represent their clients determined by the very judges before whom they're trying a case. To ensure justice, our adversarial system requires that both sides, the prosecution and defense, be represented by lawyers who have adequate amount of independence, resources, training, and time to devote to their cases. And that's just not the case here. Thank you for your time. Professor? Good morning, and thank you to the committee for having me. Um, and I want to also thank the committee because it's been clear in listening to the testimony that I've heard so far, much of it via live stream or video, um, how conscientious and thoughtful the committee is being in appropriating, uh, approaching this very difficult task. Um, and so I, I, I do want to um, acknowledge that because it is a very difficult task that you have before you. Um, and I have continued to amend my oral remarks over the last couple of days as I've, I've heard the testimony of the people who have come before me, particularly in this panel, obviously, also in previous panels as well. Um, and so the, the thing that I wanted to talk specifically about this morning that I don't talk about in my written remarks is what my position might be on the issue of independence. Um, because I do think that's the big question, ultimately, before the committee. Um, and as I've listened more and read more, I have come to more of my own uh, conclusion about what seems to me to be um, the right path. Um, and so I thought I would share that with you in, in my remarks. And obviously, I would be happy to talk about uh, any of the things that I have written and, and you know, some things that came up yesterday, such as self-cutting of vouchers, which I have some information about, um, or, or training, et cetera. But, um, so I have been thinking a lot about this issue of independence, um, and especially after reading the Prado Commission report um, and, and, and listening to the testimony again this morning, um, sort of reaffirmed for me how long it seems that this issue has been um, out there. And, and that back you know, 23 years ago, it was an issue that was before the, the committee then. Um, and it still seems to me that many of the issues um, that were raised at that time seem to be present as well. And so it leads me to think that um, perhaps something new really is needed rather than trying to reshape a model that is not working. That said, I do very much recognize the practical difficulties of doing that. I recognize that it is not, uh, that is not a decision that can just be made and you know, pie in the sky, let's just make it independent, right? Um, perhaps it's because my own experience began at the Public Defender Service, but um, because that's a model I am familiar with, I do think it's a model that is instructive. And I understand the concerns about it being a small model um, and that it, 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 it may not be nationally um, feasible in some ways, although I think um, there are other concerns um, uh, that I think I have less concern about that were, addre that were addressed and brought up yesterday. Um, so. In, in my thinking, um, I, I think that I, I'm concerned less about the public defender service model being on a larger scale. For example, going directly to Congress to ask for funding. Um, you know, I, during the sequestration times, for example, that was something that the office, you know, if, if you are going to be getting your budget from Congress, it's inevitably something you think about and you plan for in ways um, that you know Congress is constantly changing. Um, I think, and so I think that that office experienced, from what I understand, far fewer ramifications during sequestration than the Federal Defender Offices did, um, and were able to weather it. To my knowledge, there were not layoffs, there were fewer hires. Um, back to this issue of investigative resources, expert witness resources, um, people may have been a little bit more conscientious at the time, but I don't know that they were 
not able to get the resources that they needed ultimately to be, to be trying the cases they needed to be made, trying. Um, and, and I frankly have a lot of confidence in my federal defender former colleagues um, and, and CGA former colleagues um, that they can advocate quite well for themselves and if there was a committee, um, again, that had, they had their own interests at heart that they would be able to approach Congress as some of them did during sequestration um, and advocate on their own behalf. So to me, those concerns are less, um, I, I feel less strongly about them. I feel like those are concerns that could be addressed and that I have less, again, less concern than, than I think others do about. Um, I think it's also important always to remember in the backdrop of this that, that in, in many ways, um, public defenders end up being responsive, right, to cases that are being brought by the prosecution. And the reason we're having these conversations is because there are many, many more cases that are being brought. Um, and that does not only impact the defender services. I had conversations when I practiced in Atlanta with the judges. It impacts, you know, uh, judicial vacancies. It impacts probation services. It impacts across the board when you have more cases coming in. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's only realistic to expect that defense budgets are going to likewise have to grow in order to keep pace with the, the demand for services. Um, so I think I'll leave it at there. I, I'm, I'm happy, obviously, to answer questions that you might have about that. But I, I have, again, as I've been listening and, 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 and reading over the past, you know, many weeks, I really have come to the conclusion that I think it might be best to, to contemplate having it outside. And I, I very much took to heart uh, Mr. Asen's very practical, you know, um, plan, I guess, or, or potential plan to be able to do it within the judiciary. I hope there are ways to do it, um, you know, outside the judiciary as well um, that I think are important to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Just then. Good morning. Uh, I'm Larry Stengel, and uh, uh, I chair the Judicial Resources uh, Committee and have done so since uh, October of last year. Uh, when I took over that position, I received a call from uh, Judge Timothy Timkovich uh, on the Tenth Circuit who chaired the committee for four years before that and uh, congratulated me on, on uh, uh, becoming perhaps the, the most disliked uh, federal judge in the country uh, <laughs> sitting in the position of uh, Judicial Resources Chair. Uh, and. Uh, uh, he had a good laugh about that. Uh, it's not been that bad, but uh, it is. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've been on the committee for six years. I chaired the uh, uh, subcommittee on judicial statistics, uh, which is an interesting assignment for an English major. Uh, but uh, uh, that's the uh, subcommittee that does recommendations for new judgeships and assesses the weighted caseload of the uh, of the various uh, uh, 94 districts uh, and. Uh, I'd like to talk this morning just for a few minutes about a, uh, a significant recent initiative involving the Judicial Resources Committee and uh, the Federal uh, Defender Community and that we were asked in 2013 uh, to take over uh, the staffing formula development uh, for the Defender uh, Community, uh, which uh, uh, was at the time uh, not very well received by the Defender Community because when the Judicial Resources Committee does a staffing uh, formula or a work measurement analysis, uh, uh, many times that leads to a recommendation uh, for the reduction of staff. Uh, some of the history, uh, uh, as I, as I uh, have learned it, uh, is historically the, the federal defender's offices uh, made their request for staffing needs to the AO uh, office by office. Uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, uh, age of the sequester and the, uh, the budget downturn, uh, the Judicial Conference and the Executive Committee asked the, Fed, the, the Judicial Resources Committee to take over that function so that we could have a national uh, work measurement study and a national uh, staffing uh, uh, formula. Uh, and so we undertook that uh, in, uh, uh, in 2013. Uh, it was anticipated to be delivered to the conference in 2016 uh, because of budget pressures the Budget Committee and the Executive Committee asked us to accelerate that, so we were able to deliver that uh, in uh, June uh, this, uh, of this past year. I wanted to just for a, a couple of minutes walk through this work measurement uh, process uh, just to give some context uh, and, uh, uh, and some explanation of how that goes. Uh, the uh, uh, Judicial Resources Committee does work measurement analyses and staffing formulas for all work units of the federal judiciary. So we do it 
for bankruptcy uh, uh, clerk's offices, district clerk's offices, uh, probation and pretrial, uh, pro se law clerks, death penalty law clerks. Uh, we're now working on court reporters uh, and uh, uh, senior judges. Uh, judge Prado and I sat on the uh, senior judge committee together and, and uh, worked on, on that uh, uh, complex, uh, complex issue. But that's, that's, the, uh, that, that's sort of where our orientation uh, in this process, uh, the, the JRC uh, developed a, a study plan. Uh, they uh, assembled a group of 20 subject matter experts from across uh, various federal defender organizations. Uh, the uh, uh, Defender Services uh, Committee and the JRC uh, put together a combined subcommittee. Uh, Judge Cardone sat on that uh, uh, committee. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there was a, uh, a steering group of 12 federal defenders uh, to advise the AO uh, in, this, uh, in this process. The work measurement process basically asks three questions. It, it's, it asks what work a particular uh, person uh, does, uh, how long does it take that person to perform uh, that work uh, once, uh, and how often does that work uh, get performed. Uh, and they go about measuring uh, through uh, uh, various uh, uh, data gathering uh, uh, models. Uh, the, uh, uh, historically, uh, the defenders uh, kept time records uh, for uh, the work of the attorneys, but there was no uh, formal timekeeping uh, system for other uh, employees of the office, uh, such as paralegals and uh, administrators and IT people and the like. Uh, the uh, bankruptcy clerk's offices, when we did their work uh, measurement formula uh, two years ago, uh, participated in a time study. Uh, and uh, we adapted that. Uh, uh, the FDOs already had a, a, a timekeeping system. Uh, we expanded that so that that would take into account uh, tasks performed uh, by uh, uh, employees of the FDOs who were uh, not, just, uh, just, not just the attorneys. And so we had data collection, basically timesheets, uh, like we all did in practice. Uh, and uh, uh, data collection periods uh, of uh, four weeks each, we had uh, two of them. We developed a tremendous amount of, uh, of data. Uh, we looked at specific characteristics of cases. Uh, we looked at volumes of discovery. We looked at this concept of severity codes. Uh, we looked at number of defendants. We looked at the need for travel. Uh, and uh, uh, at the end of the process, uh, the, uh, uh, the study developed 150 million data points for analysis. Uh, that's unprecedented in any of our work measurement uh, initiatives with any of the other work units in the federal judiciary. Uh, and uh, a data point, for example, would be how long it takes an attorney to prepare for a hearing or how long it takes a paralegal uh, to uh, work up a file or an investigator to uh, take a statement or an interpreter uh, to meet with somebody. So we took all these various tasks, the time it took, uh, and, and that led us to these 150 million uh, data points. Uh, I was going to try to get a graphic of maybe a galaxy that uh, <laughs> would have all these stars uh, to illustrate it, but you get the idea. Um, uh, we uh, feel that we developed a, a, a database uh, that was far more uh, uh, sophisticated uh, and in-depth uh, than was available uh, uh, previous uh, to, this, uh, to this study, and it led to uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, inquiries uh, as to uh, uh, how we would weight cases, uh, whether we would continue to use severity codes, uh, whether we were to do a staffing formula for uh, the traditional federal defender offices uh, uh, or separate out the capital habeas units. Uh, we decided to separate out the capital habeas units, give them their own uh, staffing uh, formula. Uh, and uh, uh, we looked at volatility of the, of the workload uh, how uh, certain kinds of cases uh, can, can uh, impact uh, the workload of a given office, uh, depending on you know, what's, what's charged in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And, and, uh, uh, and that uh, impacts the, uh, uh, the, the, staffing, uh, the staffing needs. Uh, we organized uh, uh, defenders' offices into certain cohorts because we, have, we perceived a difference uh, among circuits, uh, sometimes circuit law impacts uh, the, uh, the, the, the workload uh, on a defender's office, uh, different from another uh, circuit. Uh, we uh, 
uh, appreciated a difference between the border courts and some of the other courts. Uh, we looked at the metropolitan courts, and so we arranged those in, in cohorts, which, which seemed to make uh, uh, sense. Um, and I'm just sort of going through the, uh, the process uh, to give you the highlights. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, despite uh, early concerns uh, that a uh, rigorous, statistically driven uh, work measurement study uh, would lead to a recommendation in a reduction or for a reduction of the staffing formula, actually the opposite happened. Uh, and we ended up uh, with a recommendation that was approved by the Judicial Resources Committee and approved then by the conference uh, for an increase uh, in 8.6 percent across the board uh, for, uh, uh, for the defender uh, community. And that's an increase not above on board, but an increase above the formula uh, that was initially calculated uh, by the Defender Services Committee the last time a study, uh, a staffing uh, formula uh, was, uh, uh, was accomplished. Uh, the, uh, the hallmark of that study uh, was an unprecedented and, and really uh, uh, wonderful uh, level of cooperation uh, between the defender community and the AO uh, in their data gathering. There was some uh, protectionism, I think. There was some skepticism at the outset. Uh, there was, a, uh, I think, some uh, uh, interest uh, in preserving uh, the data collection uh, uh, <coughs> autonomy of, of, of certain of the uh, defender offices. Uh, there was, uh, I would say, I, I know when, when we took over the uh, task of doing the, the work measurement, I received a visit from our, our defender here, uh, a well-respected and wonderful uh, uh, attorney uh, who uh, wanted to know what the heck was going to happen. And, uh, and we talked about uh, not really knowing what the heck was going to happen, but there was a real concern in the defender community that our involvement uh, would lead to a reduction across the board in, in, the, in a staffing formula. Uh, the, uh, despite that early uh, skepticism, I think, and, and the suspicion, uh, we had a, uh, a high level of cooperation. Judge Cardone would be able to speak to that with, with her involvement in the, in the combined subcommittee. Uh, the steering group was just outstanding. Uh, and uh, when this was finally presented to the executive committee, uh, there were uh, uh, a lot of congratulations uh, on, uh, to both the defender community and, and to the AO and, and the JRC uh, for their work in this, uh, in this project. Uh, it was a model of cooperation. Uh, for the subject group, that is the group being studied, uh, and the, uh, the AO staff uh, who conducted that rigorous uh, statistical analysis. Uh, and it was really, uh, I think, uh, quite a success uh, story. So we have a, a recommendation at this time, which has been approved by the conference, uh, for an 8.6% increase uh, in, uh, in staffing for the, uh, for the FDOs. A couple of those offices uh, benefit greatly. A couple of those offices suffer uh, some mild uh, percentage reductions, uh, and, uh, uh, and we have a, a plan uh, to phase uh, those in and out uh, over the next uh, two uh, fiscal year uh, cycles. So usually if I talk for 10 minutes about statistics, the audience is su sufficiently anesthetized that I don't really get any questions, so... Uh, you don't know us. I don't know, I know a couple of you. But I'm uh, hap happy at that time with that overview to answer any questions. I did do a letter uh, to Judge Cardone that, that sets forth some of these uh, points, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I want to start with Judge Fisher. And I apologize in advance for taking you out of what you've just been talking about, but since you are on the JRC uh, and have been, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how the suggestions that have been made to us, um, and they go from the, everything's fine in our district, leave it alone, to take this entirely out of the judiciary and set up a completely different uh, and independent structure. Do you have any thoughts about how uh, the various options, other than leaving everything alone, would impact the judiciary, and that is, you know, should we put everything in the hands of the uh, FPDs and CDOs? That's one suggestion. Do an FJC sentencing commission uh, model still within the AO and the judiciary, or take it out altogether? 
Uh, do you have any thoughts on how that would impact the judiciary? Because that's going to be one of our audiences. Right. Um, I, I guess the short answer is I have no strong opinion about that. I, I think that the advantage to having uh, the defender community's staffing needs analyzed uh, within the judiciary uh, is that there is a long-standing uh, mechanism in place for that uh, and that there are uh, uh, work measurement specialists, there are statistical analysts, uh, we have involved uh, subject matter experts, uh, they're very good at pulling in uh, the, uh, uh, the, the interested parties, uh, and there's a system in place uh, to do uh, a, uh, uh, an equitable uh, and, uh, uh, and honest uh, review of, of the caseload. Uh, and sometimes that leads to uh, a popular result, and sometimes that leads to an unpopular result. Uh, I think the, uh, I, I don't, I can't really speak to what impact it would have on the judiciary. I, I just know that this, uh, this uh, Can model, I ask you to lean in? Sure, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. This, uh, this model is, is in place. Uh, uh, it's, it's worked successfully uh, with uh, probably a dozen work units within the judiciary. It has credibility. Uh, it takes it out of the, uh, uh, the need for individual offices to make individual pitches to the AO for money, or if they're taken out of the judiciary to wherever they make that pitch uh, for, uh, for funding. Uh, 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 and the, the, the criticism, as I understand it, and that was before my time, uh, was that a lot of those uh, requests were anecdotally based, uh, very subjective. Uh, the, uh, the needs of a given uh, uh, office uh, were uh, based perhaps on something like a focus group uh, or, uh, or some other subjective standard. We have access to uh, uh, large amounts of data uh, it's more of a data-driven world uh, today, uh, and, uh, uh, and in fact, the, uh, the defender community seem to buy into that process uh, uh, entirely uh, as, as we move through this, uh, this work measurement. So I don't know what the advantage or disadvantage would be to the judiciary. All, all I can say is that, that we have that system in place to do a, uh, uh, an equitable uh, and balanced uh, assessment of, of the staffing needs of, 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 of the various offices. If we don't need to include that billion dollars plus in our budget, is that a, a good thing for us, maybe? I, I, don't I don't know. Um, professor, I'd like to ask you a question about um, your statement. I, I was fascinated because I've been thinking about this myself. Um, about your question, who decides what work is, in quotes, necessary? Uh, or, or what, in fact, is necessary? What does reasonable and necessary mean? What does reasonably necessary mean? Do you have some thoughts on what the answers to those questions are? Uh, well, I've been, I've been thinking a little bit about that as well. And then also, um, uh, Professor Kerr obviously isn't here today, but he had asked some prior panelists uh, what the standard you know, should be in terms of, for example, reviewing vouchers mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Um, I, you know, my concern with with a reasonableness review, sort of starting from that perspective, which is indirectly, we'll get back to your question, but um, is that as I think we heard yesterday, there can be different interpretations of reasonableness depending on who it is. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I, and I think in terms of, of necessity, we've also heard you know, some questions yesterday about whether, for example, investigators are necessary in every case. I happen to take the view that I think they are. Even in illegal reentry cases, there can be times when there are things that need to be investigated. It may not seem apparent on its face, but sometimes when you talk to a client, something comes up. And, and you know, so I think having that, that resource uh, as presumptively available for CJA attorneys and for federal defenders is something that I view as being, for example, necessary. Um, you know, but I, I I think you know. I think I think necessary needs more funding than what there currently is, and you know, and several people have talked about that. Um, you know, again, back to the question that 
came up yesterday in terms of whether people are self-cutting on vouchers. I talked to several people who do. So one of them said, I, I don't even bill for 10 to 20% of the cases that I, um, that I do. Another said, if it's four or $500 over, I don't bother, you know, I'd always go under the cap. Um, so I think, I, you know, I think, I think any of these smaller pieces really play into what counts as, as necessary, right? You need somebody who's a zealous advocate who can be well-funded, who can have expert availability and in investigative services as well. Does what a, a reasonable person with more money than would qualify him or her for indigent defense, but less than um, just to choose a name at random, Donald Trump, um, does that analysis come into it at all if, if that reasonable person would say, no, it's not worth doing this because I'm balancing the likelihood of success against how much it's going to cost me? Is that part of the analysis at all in your view? I mean, I think that's always part of an analysis because one is always subject to budget. I mean, every, uh, you know, I, both in the public defender service and in the federal defender, you know, you know that the budget requests are out there. If you're gonna, if you're gonna go ask for something that's completely unreasonable, you know that whoever's ahead of you is gonna say that's a little bit unreasonable. <laughs> like, you need to scale back the request. Um, but on the other hand, there are any number of requests, I think, that people, again, as we've, you've heard, you know, fail to make because they fear going over. So I, I think there is somewhere in the middle. I think, you know, um, I'm certain that, that creative attorneys probably could come up with any number of uh, requests um, in, in a given case, but I don't think that's the reality, and it's never been a reality that I experienced in either of the places that I work or that um, in talking to and observing people over the last you know, 15 years of my career that I've observed either. Um, I think most people are very conscientious about what they're either billing for, and because even within those offices, there's a budget, you know, and there's a budget that the head of that office has, and, and, um, and so the requests, I think, need to be realistic. That said, you know, um, I, I don't think, I thought I heard the number 900 for, for being a cap yesterday, and I, I can't even imagine ever having hired an expert that could have done anything I needed within $900. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it needs to be something, something higher than that for sure. Thank you. Ms. Grohl, I'm very interested in your, uh, your four uh, recommendations, but uh, three and four, establishing and enforcing, maybe even harder than establishing, workload limits uh, for indigent defense counsel, and then collecting meaningful data about the state of indigent defense. Any suggestions about how that could be done and how the funding for doing that uh, would be arrived at? Right. Both very good questions and ones that we, you know, and our National Right to Counsel Committee have grappled with. Um, and, you know, workload limits, and I think I've heard this said, said it really depends, some of it depends on the prosecution, like the number of cases that they're bringing, and that's completely out of our control. Um, but it's just a concern that we hear over and over and over again, and one that we felt like we couldn't submit testimony without calling attention to. And it, different districts, that limit may be different depending on the resources and budget constraints. And we completely acknowledge that. You know, I made reference to big law, and obviously the budgets for federal public defenders' offices are not the same. Um, and we understand that. But, you know, there are public defenders who are telling us that they have these crushing caseloads that are preventing them from providing adequate assistance of counsel. And for us, addressing that is something that this committee needs to do in its final recommendations. Um, we don't have you know, a number um, that we can easily provide to you, but um, it is something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Didn't the ABA come up with a number? Off the top of my head, I don't know. I think they did. I don't remember what the number is, yeah. but I'm, I believe they did. I believe there's an ABA yeah. mm -hmm. uh, recommendation. Oh. All right. Judge Walton. Well, uh, professor, I uh, share your concern about uh, independence mm -hmm. and that something needs to be done to uh, provide greater independence for defense services. Uh, and you use the DC model, which I'm very familiar with, uh, as a model that maybe would be uh, adopted by uh, the federal system. My concern with that analogy, however, is that as you know, 
We get taxed very highly, just like any other American, but we have no voting rights in D.C. And there are some benefits that are derived from that in some re respects, because sometimes Congress just let it, lets us alone. And conceivably, since you're talking about a local issue, Congress doesn't really care that much and therefore doesn't interfere. However, if it becomes national, something catastrophic happens in a state where there is voting power in Congress. My concern is that you may take, you may have some congressional member who may use that as a predicate of going after the funding made available for defense services. Um, did you think about whether that conceivably would be uh, a downside in having total independence from the judiciary? Absolutely. And I, I, let me be clear that I'm not saying it is a clear cut path that is uh, f free from, from challenges um, by any means. I think absolutely that's a very tremendous concern. And, uh, and, and, and concerns like that are why I have been over the last, you know, month or so really going back and forth in my head about what really seems realistic and feasible. I mean, I, um, one of the things I did, I do agree with Mr. Mr. Uh, Asen about is that I do think, and I think it was, he, he was the one who said it, but about having a gradual five-year plan or something. I mean, I think making that immediate leap may be logistically very difficult. But, um, but I also think, again, it, my impression of what happened, for example, during, during sequestration was that when, when the federal defenders felt as though they were not being represented in the way that they thought they needed to be by the judiciary, they went directly to Congress and lobbied. And I recognize it's a, a, that also is a unique circumstance, right? It was a, a one-time thing, and people very much rallied around social media. You know, word spread very quickly, and people who are not normally uh, thinking about defender services were thinking about it at the time. If you're asking for a budget every single year, that becomes a very different analysis than something that comes um, you know, again, that really had never happened before, I think. Um, so I, I do think it's a concern. Um, um, again, I guess my thought is there's, we've been trying what we've been trying for a s significant period of time at this point. Um, the issues seem to, by and large, be the same in many ways, even though some of them are perhaps more subtle, as Judge Prado was in indicating earlier. Um, um, so they may, they may be a little more subtle in their manifestations, but it seems as though the issues have not gone away. And so my thought is, um, you know, it, it seems like it's time to, time to actually try independence and see if that works, because I think that that, again, I, I while I, don't, I do recognize that those are concerns, I also think that, um, most of the people who are in, you know, uh, positions of being federal defenders got there because they are excellent advocates, and um, I would have some confidence in, in their ability to go before Congress and, and again, develop the relationships that they would need to make, um, think long term in the strategy for, for funding, um, you know, and realize that they, they may be subject to that and plan accordingly um, to the extent that they can. In reference to both of you, or when you say independence, do you mean independence within? the structure of the judiciary or totally freestanding outside of the judiciary? I mean total independence outside of the judiciary. Again, I, I listened carefully to Mr. Asen and I, I don't know about Ms. Kowal, but, um, um, and I, I, and I, you know, and other people, I mean, I've talked to other people who, who that's, you know, they think if, if, if we do a model like he recommended that's still within the judiciary, that, that gives more independence within the judiciary, that would still be sufficient. Um, again, I share the view that that's better than nothing, <laughs> um, but, but, I, but I do mean separate and apart. Right, we mean separate and apart from the judiciary. Um, and I, 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 I want to add a little bit to the advocacy for funding, because we were around and very heavily involved um, around the, the sequestration cuts. And um, you know, our president was very involved in advocacy with Congress. And she's a former federal public defender herself. And we also work very closely with NACDL on advocacy with Congress um, you know, on appropriations and, and budget cuts. And I, I, I want to echo the sentiment that it's really public defenders, or former public defenders, because NACDL's advocacy team is made up of a lot of former public defenders. Um, they're really fantastic advocates with Congress. They can speak um, you know, with meaning 
um, about what budget cuts will do to clients and people on the ground. And um, the lack of their ability to do that now, I think, um, is just, and I've heard it time and time again in, in testimony before this committee, um, it is really important um, to have that independence, to allow for an independent entity to advocate um, for federal public defenders with Congress um, because those budget cuts are impacting their offices. And, and that's one of the core reasons that we advocate for a separate entity outside of the judiciary. Thank you. Mr. Rao. Ms. Kral, I wanted to ask you about something in your statement. Microphone. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Can't hear this voice? This is what I do all the time, <laughs> microphone. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about something in your statement when you were talking about um, expert vouchers and judges reviewing expert vouchers or, or making a determination whether to authorize them. And in your statement, it indicated that the Constitution Project had done extensive work with former judges, and based on that work, those judges had indicated that they recognized a clear uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so you know, our National Right to Counsel Committee is made up of various stakeholders within the criminal justice system. It includes former judges. It's um, chaired by uh, Judge Lewis of the Third Circuit, and we also have a number of former uh, public defenders, former prosecutors. And so th throughout our work and our issuing of reports, those are consensus-based recommendations. Um, and those recommendations come from the views of all of these various stakeholders. And so when I say that we have consulted with judges, it's, it's including folks on our um, National Right to Counsel Committee, but also um, you know, others that, that our committee members consult with as they reach these uh, consensus-based recommendations. Thank you. Judge Stengel, you were talking to us a little bit about um, being on the committee on the resource, Judicial Resource Committee for the past six years, It's my understanding. And there was a time when the Judicial Resource Center, I'm sorry, Judicial Resource Council took over, or committee took over the staffing, if you will, from the Defender Services Committee. And we heard some testimony about how that was something that no one seemed to know about in the Defender Services Committee or the Defender Services Office, that they hadn't been consulted, that there was, they had no information, they learned of it kind of almost secondhand. Can you tell us what was going on behind the scenes? Why, how did that happen? I really have no idea. Um, uh, we, we learned through a request from the Executive Committee uh, in fact, I think I have the letter here somewhere. Um, it was, it was a, uh, a letter of June 5th, 2013, uh, signed by Judge Traxler of the uh, Chair of the Executive Committee and Julia Gibbons, the Chair of the Budget Committee, uh, asking, uh, given the enormous budgetary pressures currently facing uh, the judiciary overall, uh, they uh, wanted us to undertake a uh, uh, work measurement uh, study and uh, take over the staffing formula uh, process uh, for the uh, for the defender organization. That was not something that the JRC had any part in uh, uh, soliciting. Sorry, <laughs> I told it. <laughs> soliciting or uh, 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 we didn't go after that, uh, and uh, that was uh, something that was uh, done at the executive committee level, and we were told that it was our responsibility. And yet, that had never happened before, correct? Right. So once, you, you told us that the reason that you thought that the uh, Judicial Resource Committee was asked to do that was because they had the expertise. Um, they had the subject matter experts. Am I incorrect in uh, remembering that the subject matter experts were, all, were actually people that came from all of the defender offices? Well, the subject, we, we assembled subject matter experts for that project. Uh, uh, and they were from the defender's offices? Yes. yes. All right. So that's something that DSO could have done if, if that was necessary. Pardon? Defenders of Serv defender Services Office could have done that if they all came from the defender's offices. Um, yes, yes. And, and, and in fact, you know, the, the, one of the takeaways from this process is uh, 
with, with, the, with the increasing availability of, of uh, uh, data collection, uh, th that's becoming more the province of individual uh, departments and individual offices. It's not just something that's done at the AO. Uh, the, uh, in this process, the Defender community uh, had uh, data to offer. Uh, they, they had the RAND study. They had uh, the RAND 2 study. Uh, they had their own uh, data collection uh, 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 capacity. Uh, and, and that was combined with what the AO was, was able to add. Uh, so uh, the aggregate was, was a very good and, and thorough and complete uh, data collection process. But you're right. They have the, the ability had it then, and I think have an enhanced ability now to gather data, and, and, and uh, uh, we look uh, forward to uh, there being a, uh, uh, a participant in the discussion of what data we should be looking at and, and how, to, uh, how to gather that data and, and how to analyze it. And to your knowledge at that time, was there any discussion with the Defender Services Committee or with the folks at Defender Services Office or even at the AO about just leaving um, leaving that work with the Defender Services Office or with the Defender Services Committee, since they could compile basically the same experts as the folks in the JRC. Right. They 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 certainly can they certainly can uh, compile uh, a panel of of subject matter experts. The the thought, as I understand it. And I wasn't part of those discussions, but, but as, uh, as was reported to us, uh, we have done work measurement studies and staffing formulas uh, for decades for the, uh, for the federal judiciary in various contexts. Again, the, we do the for the bankruptcy clerk's offices and probation and pretrial and uh, death penalty law clerks and pro se law clerks and district court uh, uh, clerk's offices, court reporters. Uh, and uh, there was a sense that there was an expertise uh, and a system uh, in place uh, to gather and analyze data, uh, uh, sort of as the honest brokers of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of the data we collected without really uh, uh, an interest in which way it goes. We were simply uh, making recommendations that were driven by data that we collected. And uh, of course, the more data, the better. And, and in this particular study, uh, we had uh, more data points to analyze than, than in any other study we've done in any other department of the judiciary. And the, the chair's gone now. Let's all break for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing. And that's what's somewhat puzzling to me is that JRC had done this for decades, but they had never done it um, for the Defender Organization. It had always been kept separate, and those determinations had been made in an effort, perhaps, to keep the judiciary out of Defender staffing, the Defenders and their organizations that would be appearing before the judiciary as a party. Right. And so uh, I, that's why it's puzzling to me that there was never, or at least from what I understand from what you're testifying to, that there was never any attempt to see if that could continue. Where well, there was never discussion with DSO or DSC um, about whether or not they were capable of doing that. Yeah, I, I have the sense that the executive committee thought uh, that the process could be done better uh, by the JRC uh, and, and with the AO uh, work measurement folks and statistical people. Uh, uh, and, and we would be looking at this more as a national study and, and that would take the place of these uh, sort of individual analyses of staffing needs conducted by individual defender offices and individual requests made to the AO. I, I think it was a, a uh, an attempt uh, to uh, perhaps standardize it uh, and, and make it uh, uh, a more equitable system across the entire judiciary and, and taking into account the staffing needs of all the uh, uh, defenders' offices uh, using the same uh, rubric. And correct me if I'm wrong, but after the study was completed, the jurisdiction of, for staffing and budget did not go back to Defender Services Committee, but stayed um, removed. Is that correct? Yes, it, it remains with the JRC. So can you explain that to me? Why, why would it not go back? If, if the expertise was in the JRC and that's why they did the study, 
once the study was over, why would the jurisdiction not return to the Defender Services Committee, the, the committee that's responsible right. for Defender Services? Our, our history uh, has been to do staffing formulas on a five-year uh, basis for the various court units uh, which have been assigned to us. Um, uh, and I think the uh, Defender's uh, uh, staffing formula uh, is now in that, in that rotation. Uh, the, uh, the, the contributions of the Defender community, uh, given that we had uh, uh, members of the Defender Services Committee and the JRC in a combined subcommittee, uh, as well as the uh, subject matter experts and the steering group, those three entities uh, had significant representation uh, from the Defender community. And so I, I don't know that uh, I don't know that there's a benefit for returning it to the Defender Services Committee or to the Defender community uh, once the study's done. I, I think the uh, uh, likely the reason is that, that we have a history of uh, doing staffing formulas and then revising those on, on, a, on a rotating five-year basis. So we have right now the statistical uh, uh, information uh, uh, available and we would continue to develop and. Uh, uh, and enhance that. Uh, so I think that's probably the reason. Does it seem to you in any way unusual or any way a conflict that the judiciary would decide how many attorneys would be, how many assistant federal defenders would be in each district uh, of the federal, in the federal defender offices that the attorneys obviously appear before the judges? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's a conflict. Um, you know, we're not we're not looking at we're looking really at a, a concept called an FTE, a full time equivalent. Those are those are positions. Uh, they're attorneys, they're paralegals, they're interpreters, uh, they're admins, uh, and we're looking simply at caseload. Uh, and what the caseload statistics lead us to in terms of staffing. Uh, so, uh, you know, does, uh, is, is there an inherent conflict in there? I, I, I don't know that I want to comment about that. Okay. Let me expand that question a little and, and see what you think. The, as you probably know, there are FTEs based on the study from, uh, so FTEs in each office. Right. But then the circuit court decides how many AFPDs are in each office, correct? Right. So that's, and that could be in conflict with what the JRC decided was appropriate for a particular office. Do you see any conflict there? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it could be. I suppose it could be. Uh, again, we're, we're looking, uh, you know, our, our function is, uh, I think, limited to a, a, a gathering of statistics, an analysis of those statistics, and looking at workload, whether workload's increasing, whether it's decreasing. We have, uh, uh, we have the data points that were developed, and then we also, with the use of the steering group, uh, added some qualitative uh, analysis uh, to, uh, to take into account uh, the particular needs of particular courts, the border courts, for example. Uh, uh, courts that uh, that end up with large numbers of multi-defendant uh, 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 filings, uh, and, uh, and and to try to make recommendations uh, combining those factors. Thank you, Josh. Professor Lawler, I wanted to ask you a question about voucher review, and you talked a little bit about it in your statement, but I wanted to get an idea from you of the model that you were or think were thinking about. That's another thing I've thought a good deal about. Um, you know, I, I, I do think it needs to be out of the judiciary, I can say that. I, I, you know, whether, I, the thing I've thought a lot about is whether it's, it's uh, a better model to have someone within, say, a federal defender office or community de defender office, um, whether to have an independent uh, CJA attorney, um, panel attorney, who that is their sole role. I think whoever it is, um, you know, I think we heard some testimony about someone who has somebody walled off in their office who does just voucher review, but it's within the Federal Defender Office. Um, you know, that 
I guess that could work. I, you know, I, I don't know enough about it to sort of comment on that. I, th I think the main thing is, is what everyone else has sort of emphasized, which is that it needs to be somebody who has experience, um, who sort of knows what to be looking for. And a little bit tying back in with Judge Fisher's question from before, um, you know, I, I don't think there's a set amount of time. It, everything is so client dependent, you know. I mean, it, it just depends on the case and it depends on the client. And so I, I don't think sort of saying, well, this type of case should have X amount of time, number of hours, you know, that, that it re requires. It just, it, it's it's too person dependent. Um, um, and, so, and, and my understanding, you know, and, and it, admittedly, I've never participated in the voucher process myself. I have not, I, I've not had to do that. Um, but it's my understanding from those who I've spoken with um, that, again, you, you tend to know the outliers when you see them, you know. Um, um, and they tend to be sort of, you know, the, the extreme of unreasonable requests as opposed to, you know, um, you know, again, there's been some voucher cutting I've heard about where there's a client who's a four-hour drive away and, and, you know, the, the judge said, well, you've gone to see the person once. I don't know why you need to see them more than that, right? And so I'm not going to pay for the other eight hours you spent going there to talk to the client. Um, um, you know, and that to me is, is a problem. So I, I think it needs to be somebody independent. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I have a strong view as to whether it's somebody, I mean, I do think it needs to be somebody who has, that's their job, um, because I think it tends to be so much of what somebody does. Um, you know, I, I think I have, there are also, obviously, you've heard about people within, you know, having the, basically the federal defender in, in a jurisdiction be the person who does the voucher reviews. Um, I think it depends on the jurisdiction, but that obviously could create a sizable amount of work, I think. And I know there are some people who do it and seem to think that that's just a part of their position. Um, you know, my thought is it's probably worth funding a separate position because I do think it could be, you know, at least part time of a position or, or a full position depending on what district you're in. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Miss Grohl, is that the correct pronunciation? It's it's good. Say it again. For, <laughs> say it say it again for me. Graywall. Graywall. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start with you, and I wanted to talk to you. And I I don't know if you have information about this, but you spoke briefly about TCP's advocacy on behalf of federal defenders during the sequester. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you have any feedback for us on the reception TCP received on either side of the aisle um, and any views on the likely success of defenders in advocating for themselves in light of that experience. Yeah, you know, I have some information about it. And I think uh, what's tough to say is I think with each Congress um, and, and their budget and appropriators, and the appropriations committee makeup, you know, that can change from year to year or Congress to Congress. And so it's tough to say with any certainty what, what works and what doesn't, depending on the makeup of the appropriations committee. Um, what I think tends to, I mean, speaking as um, policy counsel who does a lot of advocacy um, on uh, criminal justice issues before Congress, I think what really resonates with staffers and members of Congress is um, people who can go in and speak with experience and and um, and lean on their own experience. And so, having federal defenders who can go in and speak to the importance of funding um, is so critical. And that's why we, you know, repeatedly emphasize this this independence issue. To have someone who is independent from the judiciary advocating for their own budget, who can speak to why those budget requests are so critical, and um, not have to justify it as part of the judiciary's expenses as well. I think, you know, there, uh, as you've heard, there's this this conflict of of trying to uh, explain the judiciary's budget versus the defender's budget, and I think having this independent entity that can go in and speak with um, congressional staff about just the federal public defender's budget um, is critical. And so, I, you know, I don't know if I have advice per se, um, but I do think it's, it's the wealth of knowledge and experience that one can bring to the table in advocacy that, that ultimately translates into some success. So one of the things that both you and uh, well, both you and Professor Lawler emphasize that need to be able to advocate for funding, and uh, and that is a basis for complete independence from the judiciary. But 
so I guess I wanted to question you a little bit about that because, of course, the, um, uh, the uh, Sentencing Commission uh, and uh, I'm, sorry, I'm blanking on it, the, the, FJ, the FJC uh, have the opportunity to submit their budget separately and I think have chosen to rely upon the advocacy of the Judiciary's Budgetary Committee, um, but certainly aren't bound by that and could advocate on their own. Is there a reason that, w that a system in which uh, defenders could advocate and took advantage of that wouldn't be an adequate, uh, an adequate model. Um, well, so I mean, I think the NACDL's report actually does a really great job of explaining why it's important to have this independent entity doing that advocacy work, um, and we've really pulled our recommendations from a lot of that. Um, there's absolutely, you're right. I mean, given the lack of independence right now, there's no, there's not much constraining them from doing that. But again, it, it's this independent function um, that we believe is so necessary for, for good advocacy, advocacy that works. For me, I think it comes down fundamentally, again, to this issue of this sort of inherent conflict and having the judiciary have some control over one part of, uh, you know, the system in front of it and not the other. Um, and I, and I, I do think there are various ways in which that manifests. And I think they would certainly absolutely be lessened if there were a model that was like the Sentencing Commission as opposed to the model that there is now. Um, and if there was the ability for, in the event that, for example, the defenders felt like they were not being adequately represented um, by the judiciary to uh, to be able to go and advocate on their own. Um, you know, I think I think that's the tension. It's part of what Judge Walton was getting at as well, right? Is that there is this sort of you know, in, in, in some ways, and I know that the defender community is very split on this. You know, that there are benefits sometimes to having the judiciary be the advocate, uh, or that's you know, the, the people who are in favor of that view. Um, I think you know it's it sort of it is part of the larger systemic issue of um, it, in some jurisdictions that works great and in sometimes it, it doesn't right I mean if you look at you know district by district things vary division by division things vary um, I think it could depend on who is doing the advocating in that situation I think as long as there's a, at least some mechanism for the defender community to be able to go advocate on their own if they needed to to me that's that's the most important thing but I don't know then if their voice gets Silence. If they say, "Look, you know, normally the judiciary advocates for you. Why should we? Why should we listen to you in this instance?" For example. So I, I, I'm not inherently opposed to it, but my instinct leans more toward, you know, again separating those functions because I do think inherently there is a tension that that lies there. Um, so you, you mentioned the potential advantages of having the judiciary advocate or being within the judiciary, and I guess one of the things I, I, I'd like to ask if either of you have studied in, in or, or if you know of anyone who has looked in a systematic way at that hypothesis. And I say hypothesis because, of course, we know that there were years in which the Defender Services account has done better than the other judiciary accounts. And, of course, we know of at least one instance when, while within the judiciary, uh, uh, the death penalty resource centers, which were a Defender Service uh, uh, a function were defunded entirely because they'd become a hot button issue and the judiciary wasn't able to prevent that. So, I'm, you know, so we have lots of anecdotes. People have lots of views about what Congress would or wouldn't do. And I'm very interested to know if you know of anybody who's really looked at this in a, in a systematic way. I don't. It's one thing I, I, um, I hadn't looked at that specific issue, but I was intrigued when asked to be on this, you know, to come in and testify. Uh, how little seems to be out there um, that has been written, for example, in legal academia about any of these issues, which seemed to me um, that's, you know, you're going to gonna find people who can do the statistical analysis and do that. Um, uh, with a with a careful eye in that realm, so I will continue to look and, and again get get back to the to committee and to the commission if there's if I find anything. I I'm not aware of any at this time. Um, Judge, can I ask you a couple questions sure. about? And first, I, I'd like to say, you know, on, on behalf of defenders, we're certainly appreciative of of the role that both the committee and particularly its staff, uh, Harvey Jones and his staff. 
played as what we feel are really honest brokers in this process. Um, but still, I'd like to press you a little bit on a couple of the aspects of the way this happened. Um, you know, my recollection is that sometime back in 2010, uh, the Policy and Strategic Initiatives Office, which functions as a staff for the Judicial Resources Committee, had essentially been loaned to uh, the Defender Services Office to do a sort of subsidiary study on these ratios of staff to attorneys. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's any structural barrier that would have prevented the study that we just spoke about, the larger study, have, from having been performed in the same manner. I, I honestly don't know uh, if there would be any barrier to that. Um, yeah, I know that it was a uh, uh, it was it was a process that 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 proceeded incrementally, uh, and uh, I think the uh, uh, the impetus for getting the JRC involved uh, wholesale uh, in the uh, work measurement study. Uh, you know, I don't think it's any secret. It was it was at the time of the sequester and an enormous uh, emphasis uh, throughout the entire system for. Uh, uh, cost containment and even aggressive cost containment uh, measures. Uh, and so uh, I think there was a sense that, that a robust, statistically driven uh, staffing formula uh, would be uh, perhaps more credible to, to our funding sources. Uh, and, uh, but I don't know uh, why that earlier 2010 initiative couldn't have been carried over. I don't know what the exact executive committee's uh, thinking was about that. Yeah, and, and, and I guess you sort of led into what was the second question I had, which is there, you know, when the executive committee made its decision, it transferred uh, jurisdiction over staffing and compensation of defender offices to the JRC from the Defender Services Committee. And uh, this is a somewhat similar question to the one before, but was there any reason they couldn't have simply directed uh, the JRC to do that study and directed the Defender Services Committee to have cooperated with the JRC in doing that study without removing juris final say so final jurisdiction. I, from the I really have no idea uh, what what the executive committee thinking was about that. I mean, as, as a practical matter, uh, there was a uh, uh, there was a very uh, extensive cooperative effort between yeah. the. Defender Services Committee uh, and and the JRC and that and that continues. I mean, there's no, uh, it it really is a joint effort at this point. I, I think their their subject matter and content expertise uh, uh, is invaluable, and and we don't supply that. Uh, and our uh, data analysis and uh, and work measurement uh, analysis uh, is what we bring to the table. Uh, and I think that was uh, uh, that may have been the thinking of the executive committee and the budget committee that we needed something that was uh, 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 maybe a more solid statistical analysis to uh, to seek uh, funding uh, for these positions uh, moving forward from the sequester. Yeah, I, and and I I take your point on that. I guess my question is: there's it was. Is, was there a reason that we couldn't have taken advantage, and when I say we, defenders, couldn't have taken advantage of the particular expertise of the Judicial Resource Committee and of its staff without losing ultimate control over their own fate? I just don't know that. Yeah, uh, yeah they, for, the, for those of us who aren't a part of it, the Judicial Conference is, is terribly opaque, and we never quite understand what's going on. Maybe for those who are a part of it as well, I don't know. Um, You, you know, in, in retrospect, well, let me ask one other question about the way and things. There was also a decision made to accelerate that study. Do you know, was there any consultation uh, before that decision was made with the JRC, with the Defender Services Committee, before the Executive Committee directed that acceleration? I'm not aware of any. Uh, I, was, uh, I was not on the subcommittee to do that. I know that the letter of uh, June 5, 2013, to Judge Timkovich uh, simply uh, asked uh, on behalf of the Budget Committee and the Executive Committee that we accelerated by a year. Uh, and, and I think that had to do with the, uh, you know, the emergent situation with, with the sequester and, and the need to get a strong statistical 
uh, basis uh, for funding requests uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Let me ask you a question is, uh, about that, and that's that, you know, you, you mentioned both the original decision, and I think that decision accelerating it, um, that the, the request to the JRC came not, not merely on behalf of the executive committee, which is charged with determining the jurisdiction and the actions of the various committees, but also on behalf of the, the budget committee. And critical, I think, to the success and credibility of the JRC is its role and reputation as an honest broker. And when the budget committee is part of the, the, the group directing the JRC, is there some risk to the reputation of the JRC as an honest broker? Is it more likely that people not part of the process are going to see it as, uh, you know, as an agent of cost containment rather than as an agent honestly studying the process and seeing what's really needed? I, I can only say that in other contexts uh, there have been requests by the Budget Committee uh, that we take a second look at certain staffing formula uh, for, for various other work units. Uh, and uh, uh, because of the <coughs> dissatisfaction expressed by that community with, with the staffing formula uh, as it was delivered, uh, our response has been that we go where the data takes us and we, re we remain uh, the honest brokers uh, of, of, uh, of what the data uh, reveals to us and what we recommend based on that. If there are to be policy decisions or fixes uh, or floors or ceilings, uh, that those are matters uh, uh, more of the executive committee and, and the budget committee, but but we have. Uh, I, I don't I don't feel that our uh, committee has any any pressure uh, uh, from the budget committee in an era of cost containment uh, to uh, uh, somehow manipulate data uh, or or develop data uh, or interpret data in such a way as to achieve a result. Uh, we remain uh, looking at. Uh, what the data gives us, uh, what the, where the data directs us, and, and what the data uh, suggests, and, and, that's, and that's as far as we go. Yeah, and I think that's Defender's experience. I was asking more a sort of reputational question. Is it a risk to the, to the reputation, which is one of the chief assets, right. the goodwill of the JRC, yeah. that that no, I, I think we, we, we do what we do, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, we have responded to inquiries from other committees uh, whose, whose staffing formula uh, for their population has been affected uh, or, uh, uh, well, it's been affected by, by our recommendations and, uh, and we respond with what the data shows us. So I, I don't, I'm not too concerned about an, an impact on, on reputation. I, I get that these requests come from, from interested parties and the budget uh, committee has a, a legitimate, a genuine interest uh, in uh, uh, in how much they're going to go to Congress to ask for for the judiciary. Let me ask about one last thing, and that you mentioned both fixes and floors and other, and you're talking about adjustments that I, I think are found to be necessary because data, while it's wonderful, doesn't capture the nuances right. of what we in the legal system do. Um, do you think we'd be better off if once formulas were developed that the entire implementation was left to those offices, divisions that are directly uh, supervising the work of whatever units involved because they're in a position to sort of look at those nuances in a way that maybe the data-driven approach of, of the JRC is less able to do? I think that's a good question. Um, with our recent experience with the bankruptcy staffing formula, uh, there was a recommendation uh, because of a continuing uh, and, and almost precipitous decline in filings that there would be re a reduction uh, in, uh, uh, in the staffing levels uh, uh, implemented over a several year period of time. Uh, there was uh, some uh, good faith and, uh, and honest pushback to that uh, because of the impact on, on uh, uh, various bankruptcy clerk's offices. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, I think, a very responsible uh, and a realistic 
interaction among the JRC, the Budget Committee, the Executive Committee, and the Bankruptcy Committee in coming up with a solution to that. So uh, uh, whether, whether that suggests the, the staffing formula, once it's put in place, should go back to the Subject Committee for implementation, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Uh, I can tell you that where there are problems uh, personnel problems, and these are these are people with jobs and, and uh, people with responsibilities uh, whose lives are affected uh, by these decisions from time to time. Uh, that there is a great deal of of uh, 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 scrutiny uh, and uh, uh, and uh, efforts to compromise uh, and efforts to soften uh, any kind of uh, uh, negative uh, impact uh, from these staffing formulas, and that involves the subject. Committee. So, so in a in a real sense, they are involved. Uh, but the, I think the JRC and the Budget Committee stay involved because they have uh, a, a uh, they have an interest because they've they've come up with the formula and they have taken into account uh, not only the statistical uh, uh, factors but uh, but the uh, the, qual the qualitative uh, 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 sometimes subjective uh, issues that that drive the uh, the staffing formula as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I just have one other question for Ms. Uh, Graywall. Uh, one of your recommendations is that there be parity in funding between prosecutors' offices and uh, defense offices. And I understand what you're trying to accomplish yeah. through that. And having done both defense and prosecution, they're very different. And it's one thing to handle 20 or have assigned 20 cases as a prosecutor as compared to having 20 clients as a defense lawyer. And I guess one of the concerns I have is if you start talking about parity, could that conceivably result in defenders having to handle more cases than what they should handle? Because if you talk to prosecutors, they'll tell you they're overwhelmed by cases. Right. And having, as I say, done both, I could do maybe 20 mm -hmm. prosecutions at one time, but it's very different to have the same number of, of, of uh, individuals who you're representing. Mm -hmm. So could asking for parity maybe result in defenders having to actually handle more cases than what they handle now, which would make it more difficult yeah. for them to carry out their Sixth Amendment obligations? That's a great question. You know, could our recommendation on parity backfire, essentially? Um, we are, uh, and the recommendation on parity is really for funding, and it, it's really aimed at legislators because. But the legislator who doesn't understand the difference between the functions could say, well, if right. a prosecutor can handle 20 cases at one time, why can't a defense lawyer do that's, the same? That's right, that's a, that's a great point. Um, but we are nowhere near parity. Um, in terms of funding um, for prosecution versus what is allocated to uh, public defenders, um, both you know what goes to states and what what what's happening at the federal level, and so that recommendation is really aimed at even trying to get us closer to the amount of funding that prosecutors are receiving. Um, I think once we get to even something close to parity, we could probably get. We might get those sorts of questions, but right now, I mean, with the level, the current level of funding that that defenders are receiving, as compared to what's going to DOJ and what's um, being allocated to to states for law enforcement and prosecution, um, you know, there's no way that that we would. I think that that's an argument that's sort of far in the future because we're still at a point where we're just trying to get, like. We're basically at one percent to their, you know, over fifty percent. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, you know, but it is it is so drastically different that that's that's really what that recommendation is aimed at. Thank you. Uh, our chair had another meeting that she had to attend, so she apologizes for having uh, left. Uh, is is there anyone else, Doctor? Rucker, do you have some questions? If I may, just uh, two or three questions for Judge Stengel. Sure. Uh, not just as your role as a member of the JRC, but just as a judge. Um, would you be willing to give up a uh, review of vouchers? <laughs> or do you think that should stay within the judiciary and that the judges should do that? 
You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know that I would. Um, uh, I think there's a, uh, I think there's a cost issue uh, in all of these. I mean, that's that's the reality of of uh, 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 providing public funding for for indigent defense. There's there's some, there's got to be some control. Uh, you know, I, I think the uh, uh, so I, I I think somebody has to review uh, the uh, uh, the expenditure at, at, at some level. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard some of the comments today, and it's really sort of out of my uh, jurisdiction. But uh, w when you talk about uh, independence of the defender function from the judiciary, uh, I wonder if there if there is a better advocate for the defender function uh, than the judiciary. Uh, in, in our system. Uh, a, a trial judge, and I've, I've been a trial judge for 25 years, uh, I think has a strong appreciation for uh, the, uh, the vital contribution uh, of, the, uh, of the public defender, the federal defender, uh, to the process. And not simply because it makes my job easier than dealing with somebody unrepresented, uh, but because it, it affirmatively advances uh, the, uh, the interest of a just result uh, taking place. Uh, and having been through, uh, fortunately, uh, a very short uh, stint in the political system, having to run for judge in a, in a state that elects its judges, uh, I, I don't know how I would feel about um, the defender community pitching its need for funding uh, to uh, certain uh, uh, elected officials in certain jurisdictions. Some places I think they'd be enormously receptive, other places maybe not so much. <coughs> I think that that request for funding when, when made to or through the judiciary uh, is made uh, to and through a very receptive audience that respects the function and, and understands the need uh, for a robust defense uh, in, in every case. So uh, that would be my view just as a judge, not as a JRC uh, chair about that. But I think in terms of the review of vouchers, I, I think at some point along the line, if there's public money being used, somebody has to review how that's being used. Judge, can I, can I just follow up on that, Dr. Rucker? I, I totally understand that argument that there has to be oversight because these are public funds. But, how do I say this? The prosecution does the same thing. They expend public funds and there's oversight but it's not judicial oversight. Right. And I would say the same thing about being an advocate. My guess is that most judges, maybe yourself included, would say that you would be one of the strongest advocates for the prosecution function, that they do excellent work, that they're part of the justice equation, that they make a difference mm -hmm. in the same as the, as the defense. Right. But yet the oversight is not judicial. And, and I would go back to uh, uh, that argument that uh, the defender community may be uh, in a better position to seek its funding through a channel that uh, respects and protects that function uh, as vital to the system. Uh, I, I think if with, we, you know, with, certain, with certain members of, the, of the, uh, uh, the legislative branch, if, if you approach them with a request for X amount of dollars for the prosecution function, that resonates with them, and that's, that's community protection, and that's, that's where they want money spent. Uh, if you approach them for a, a certain amount of money uh, to defend somebody who's committed uh, what uh, uh, appears to be a very heinous crime, uh, I don't know that you have that level of sympathy for the defense function in all uh, areas of, of the uh, of, of the political realm, and I think I think that's I think that sits more squarely and and more solidly, uh, uh, and uh, and there's a greater level of responsibility toward that function in the judiciary. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rock. <laughs> thank you. Uh, one more question then. Uh, one of the things that we've heard is that there have been complaints about delays in payments of vouchers and, and also cuts in vouchers at the circuit level. Mm -hmm. 
Do you see much value added in, in having these vouchers, excess vouchers, go up to the Court of Appeals for review to judges who never <coughs> don't know much about the case, who don't have not had anything litigated before them on the case? I, I think all I can say about that is that's a great question. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't, well, uh, th that's, that's, a, that's a pretty hot issue uh, right now. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I think it's entirely possible for a, a court of appeals judge to review a voucher and ask uh, legitimate and responsible questions about the expenditure. Um, and uh, uh, you know, that's where they go right now. And, and I, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't know that I want to express an opinion as to whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. I, I know that I look at my vouchers very carefully, uh, and uh, uh, if uh, my, my feeling is if that's what it costs, that's what it costs. Dr. Rucker, can I hate to interrupt yes, you? Can I chime in? The, the, I think the, the general sentiment uh, right now is that the circuit judge can reduce but not increase. Mm -hmm. uh, based on what you said, do you have a thought about whether the circuit judge should also have the ability to increase the voucher if the district judge has reduced it? I would think so. I would think so. Anyone else? Yeah, Mr. Kong? One, one quick question for you. I, this is sort of in your JRC hat but bearing on this issue. It's always seemed to me a curious thing that in an enterprise you'd have the highest value employees essentially reviewing bills. And I'm wondering if, if the JRC, if anyone's ever at, considered asking the JRC to study the amount of time and effort that judges put into this effort and whether or not it really makes sense. Um, we haven't, uh, and I don't think that's a bad idea. I think that's, I think that's worth considering. We, we, don't, uh, we don't do work measurement for appellate judges uh, right now. We don't have a weighted caseload uh, mechanism, uh, and uh, you know, that, that may be something that would tie into that. Anyone else? Just, just, single, I just wanted to. Not yet. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up on um, what Dr. Rucker asked with respect to the uh, role of judges in, in voucher review. And, and I'm curious, I, I certainly understand the perspective, and as, as Ms. Rowe indicated, it's public money. Somebody's got to perform an oversight function. And certainly within the defender community, um, the individual defenders are charged with overseeing the budgets of their office and their federal employees who uh, have the confidence of the system to perform that function. And so I'm curious if, if you have any thoughts about whether or not uh, it would be problematic uh, for that voucher review function to be placed under the responsibility of somebody else, be it the defender or someone within the defender's office or some of the other models we've heard like a supervisory attorney or some other professional person performing that function instead of the judges? Well, I, I, think, um, I think it probably stems from the fact that we have the appointment power for the CJA attorney. Uh, and uh, we have some responsibility uh, at, to uh, look at the cost uh, of that appointment uh, to the system. Uh, so uh, wh when somebody comes to us for a request for an investigator or a psychologist or uh, interpreter, uh, I think we have to look at whether that's a, a response, whether that's necessary in the case. Uh, and, and I think the benefit of the doubt certainly goes to the defendant and to the person requesting uh, that money. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, the, the approval of the voucher, it, it may make sense for the person who's actually responsible for the appointment to do that approving and, and maybe not delegate that to uh, uh, the head of the defender's office who, who probably has a great amount of work to do in other areas. Uh, and uh, uh, but I, I, I just think that that probably emanates from the, uh, from the appointment power. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? If this committee thinks it's difficult talking about resources for defense, you should see uh, Judge Stingle and I having to figure out resources for senior judges. Now that gets really hot. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was. 
uh, Judge Stingle, uh, Professor Lawler, uh, Ms. Graywall, thank you very much for your time here. Uh, it's very valuable. Yeah. If you have anything else you want to add afterwards, any afterthoughts uh, on your way home or uh, after you leave here that, that you wish to amend or add to, to your testimony, please uh, get us uh, some written information on that. We, we welcome uh, any further comments that you might have. Uh, thank you very much for your, your time. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank thank you. you.